Hospitality education can't be produced without experiential learning. The new model of service learning, community engaged service learning, is where you have a community partner and together you learn from one another. We've had a mentoring relationship where each of us have been paired with a refugee. During the actual class, we put on a banquet dinner and we had to hire people, we had to train them. So that was something I've never personally done. I've been hired, I've been trained, but I was never on the other end. My students then write job descriptions, go through the whole selection process, hire, then manage them the night of the event. It's a great experience. If I had taken this class without the component of having a protege to work with, I don't think I would have gained as much as I did from this class. There is something so powerful about experience and about relating with other humans that, that stays with someone for a long period of time. Initially, when you're working with somebody whose culture is very different from your own, there's going to be hurdles and it's going to be a little bit difficult to get past that, whether it's different customs, different norms. Being able to learn that, being able to experience that is so worth going over those hurdles. Being a mentor in this program really taught me the difference between being a manager and being a leader. It's definitely been a way for me to learn to manage in a way that isn't so deadline oriented or administrative oriented. It's much more about the person. There isn't another program in the world that's doing anything like this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Corson, Associate Professor and Director of the Fritz Noble School of Hospitality Management at the Daniels College of Business. Thank you and good evening. It's my great pleasure to be here and I'll introduce tonight's special guest in a moment. I just wanted to let you know that that program, the Ready for American Hospitality program, is one that has garnered several international awards for the Fritz Noble School. Uh, we're in our eighth year of running this program. Uh, and actually this morning, uh, converted, uh, did the re-grand opening of, uh, or the grand reopening, I should say, of uh, the Beans Cafe in the Corbell School of International Relations in the C Complex as a social enterprise cafe, a social good cafe dedicated to supporting the RA program. It's the link between RA and what we're doing in Fritz Noble uh, to tonight is that our guest, Denny Marie Post, is an innovator. And I'm gonna introduce Denny in a moment, but first I have to thank you for being here. And as you know, this series is free and open to the entire Denver community and would not be possible without the support of our financial sponsors. I want to thank U.S. Bank for its sustained and committed support of this program. U.S. Bank is an invaluable partner to VOE and to Daniels, and we're grateful to them for their partnership. We also want to thank the Zayo Group and Newmont Mining for their support and contribution as well. And now, our guest, Denny Marie Post, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Red Robin. She oversees all United States and Canadian operations. And since joining Red Robin in 2011, Denny has brought value to the organization in several roles, including Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Concept Officer. She brings to the team more than 35 years of leadership experience in consumer-driven marketing, product innovation, and building teams and executives to develop executive strategies that increase brand awareness and drive sales. Then he's gonna to speak to you for a bit, and then I'm gonna come back out and we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation. And we'll end with questions from you. So here she is, Denny Mary Post. Thanks, David. It's a pleasure, thank you so much. Well, good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. I have to say, when I came out and looked, I think this is the first time I've presented to anybody in velvet chairs. So that may be a first. I've done a lot of presentations because I love to 
talk about a number of topics. Um, obviously, the restaurant industry is a passion of mine. Advancing women is a passion of mine. And a chance to just to kind of talk to students. So let me hear, how many of you all out there are still students? Okay, that's the 14 that had to come tonight. That's, that's what it is. How many of you all wish you were still students? Well, I hope that what I have to offer tonight will kick this series off successfully for the year because after all, I'm in the restaurant business. And in the restaurant business, we want to keep you coming back for more. I do not want to be personally responsible for driving down attendance to the future series. So we'll see what we can do. I was asked to talk about two things in particular this evening. First, to speak to my experience, duh, that's the name of the series, and also to spend some time discussing the disruption that our industry is undergoing at this time, and of course, the outlook for the future of restaurants. I'm gonna do both, but I also wanna take an opportunity to speak about something that's near and dear to my heart, and it relates to both my personal story and my career, and also what we need so desperately in our industry, and that is the topic of resilience and the importance of bouncing back. Ladies, you out there? Can't see you. All right, love that. Um, resilience is particularly key for those of us in our career, and I'll speak to that as we go. So let's start with today, how I got here today. I am, in fact, the president and CEO of Red Robin Gourmet Burgers and Brews, very proudly. It's a 50-year-old restaurant chain, concept with about $1.5 billion in annual sales and a market cap. As of this morning, I didn't look lately, but $375 million. Nowhere near where it needs to be, but we'll get it there. I'm the mom to two boys. Uh, one who is now 25 years old, and the other who is 62. Um, <laughs> that joke actually worked a whole lot better when my little one was eight, but um, <laughs> let's face it, uh, the men are still always boys at heart, and uh, that's what makes them so charming. I'm also the wife of almost 26 years to the older of those two boys, and he's here with me tonight, which is a first for him, actually. Um, I'm the member of two public company boards, Red Robin, which I serve, of course, as part of my responsibility, and Wyndham Destinations. I am, unfortunately, too rarely a uh, female on boards. We have a long way to go there. Uh, we've made progress, but particularly in Colorado, if any of you gentlemen are out there or ladies out there responsible for board development, you could use a lot more women on your board, and I'm happy to help you find them. I am the chair of the Women's Food Service Forum. We have for 30 years been developing leaders in our industry, and as I was watching the video and I saw all those great women from the Fritz Nobel School, I kept thinking about the pipeline that we have. We have this tremendous pipeline in food service of women coming up through hospitality and food service. But we've recently shifted our focus from not just developing leadership talent, but also focusing more with leaders of businesses on how we can achieve greater gender representation, and ultimately gender parity in the industry. The McKinsey study that was most recently done, annually done, the Women in the Workplace study, tells us it will take 100 years at the pace we're moving to achieve charity, uh, not charity, to achieve charity, it shouldn't be charity, to achieve equity in the C-suite. I have a grandniece whom I adore. She was born just a couple of years ago. That means that she may not see parity in the C-suite. That is unacceptable to us and should be unacceptable to all of you as well. I'm also a member of the Denver Branch Board of the Kansas City Federal Reserve, where I get to share my perspective on the regional trends that we have here in the Denver area, and more broadly on my business in particular in retail and restaurants. And once every two months, behind closed doors, I get to opine on whether or not we should increase interest rates, uh, which again, we do behind closed doors as opposed to our president who likes to do so on Twitter but just the same. So that much pretty much sums it up. Uh, I'm a president, a CEO, a wife, a mother, a board member, and I'm an advocate for women in advancement. And tonight, I'm your voice of experience, which is good because I like everyone here and the sum total of my experiences. They are completely unique, and I will assure all the students in this audience, completely unpredictable. How did I get here? <clears throat> well, there are three themes in my career. I was really, really good at something. My unique core competency is innovation. It's fueled by a set of strengths that I bring forward that include being facile with ideas, highly strategic, and one of those people who can take anything and make it just a little bit more than what it was. In addition to that core competency, I was willing to take risks. 
which again is something that women need to do more of. Too often, we wait until we've checked every single box on the list before we'll raise our hands and say we're ready. Meanwhile, guys who've got maybe two out of the 12 will have said, put me in, coach, and there'll be three of them competing for the job. Women have to let go of that and be willing to take greater risk. But in addition to some of those risks, and some of them frankly didn't turn out all that well for me, I was persistent and I bounced back from failures of which I have certainly had my share. After a semi-normal childhood, and I say that if one can include moving eight times before the age of 12 to be normal, my career has been a further series of all kinds of twists and turns over time. Careers, as I said, have come to realize rarely, and I emphasize the word rarely, turn out the way one anticipates. And I will tell you, they are very rarely a straight line. The extent to which you are buffeted by those challenges or you thrive in them is really up to you. So you may have guessed, um, I was a military brat, army brat to be specific. At the age of 12, my dad retired to El Paso, Texas. Now, up until this time, El Paso has been mostly known as a bad cowboy song, but now, of course, it's the home of Beto O'Rourke. So it's now much more in the news. We'll see how long that lasts, but it's in the news. Um, we arrived there in the middle of eighth grade, and so if anyone's doing the math or cares, that was a year ahead because I had gone to what was then an experiment called an ungraded primary in elementary school, and I moved forward a little faster than planned, which is great when you're eight years old. It's a little bit less so when you're 12, and you relocate in the middle of a year to a new city and a new school, and it seems like everyone is a teenager and you haven't gotten there yet. I survived that. I went on to high school and then to another because my father needed to move once again across town in the middle of my freshman year of high school. I thrived there and went on to college at Trinity University in San Antonio, which if you know your geography is roughly as far away from El Paso as Denver is, which is just about far enough away from El Paso, but one can always go further. <laughs> Not my favorite place on the face of the earth. I hope I haven't insulted anybody out there. Um, there's the old Mac Davis song about nothing's better than Lubbock in the rearview mirror. I'd say El Paso is a close second. <laughs> I, uh, I got to San Antonio. I needed to work. Um, I was here at a private college, and while I was uh, well supported by my parents in some ways, I was responsible for my own uh, personal expenses. And I started working in a bar as a cocktail waitress down on the river. I was 17, but because it was legal to drink at 18, they assumed I was 18, and I just continued to bluff them all the way through. I bartended all the way through college, which I think had a lot to do with what I learned in those years. I majored in journalism because I was convinced I would be the female Woodward and Bernstein, both of them put together, of course, I was going to be that good. Watergate had just happened, and I wanted to be a renowned journalist. But having discovered just before graduating that um, being a renowned journalist paid slightly less than bartending, I chose to start my career in advertising instead, which was fortuitous if unlikely, but a great move for me in so many ways. I can trace every single one of the moves in my career to that very first job that I had, to the formative relationships I have got there, and the hard work and strong grounding I got in good, smart thinking. It opened the doors for what is now a 40-year career, not 35, I need to update my bio, to include, of course, my current role here at Red Robin. I moved from advertising to new products consulting to place-based publishing. Anybody here ever go to a school that had Channel One News in their classrooms? Maybe not. It was an advertiser-supported news program, very controversial. I was involved with that for a few years. And then I went to restaurants. Specifically, I started with a company called KFC, of course, Kentucky Fried Chicken. It was then led by a guy, the same guy who had hired me out of college, and he had become the head of this organization. I started with what was then PepsiCo Restaurants. It was spun out as Tricon Brands, KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. It later was renamed Yum Brands. And I said yes to the opportunity fairly on to become the chief marketing officer for all three brands in Canada. I started there when my six-year-old was just moving into first grade, and I convinced my husband to be my trailing spouse for the first time out of the country. From there, we moved back to Kentucky, 
so I could become the chief innovation officer at KFC before moving on to Miami to be the head of food and beverage and innovation and marketing for Burger King. We launched a little coffee program there called, with high caffeine coffee that was called BK Joe, and it caught the eye of a slightly larger coffee company across the country called Starbucks. And before I knew it, I was living in an apartment and commuting between Miami and Seattle, which if you don't know is the longest single nonstop flight in the United States. But mostly, I was traveling the world as the head of Starbucks Global Food and Beverage, and occasionally taking that grueling red eye home, where my husband was seeing my son through to the age of his 13th birthday and finishing seventh grade. Now, Starbucks, if you remember, was, or I will share with you, was kind of the canary in the mine of the Great Recession when it came to retail and businesses. And the reason was simple. They had fueled their phenomenal growth, unit growth, uh, not only on all of our need and addiction for coffee, but the launch of the Frappuccino, which last time I checked is something you want, not need. And sure enough, the recession showed Starbucks that. People still came in the morning to get their cup of joe, but they were all gone when it came to that afternoon second visit for a Frappuccino. And the business went into its first stutter in all of its years. In the 15 months that I was there, I saw three different reorganizations, and I decided, having committed to my now freshman, that I would not move him again, that I needed to leap before I got invited out. And I went to work for an old colleague from KFC. He had just become the CEO of T-Mobile, which was owned by, owned by Deutsche Telekom at the time, and it was headquartered just across Lake Washington. Now, I was resistant about this. I was a restaurant person, right? I love restaurants, I love food service. But he convinced me that I could easily translate all of that knowledge about restaurants and innovation and marketing skills to the wireless business. And he was right. He was right about that part. But he failed to mention how utterly miserable I would be in a business where the user's only affinity is for the device they're carrying and certainly not the carrier who's providing the service. When I arrived, we had just reached north of 95% penetration of cell phones, and the business went from acquisition to share battle overnight. And while we were the country's largest seller of blackberries, remember those? We were the only one without the iPhone. It was nuts. On the third full week of eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner in a conference room, and I literally waiting to put on my makeup until I reached the office, because more often than not, frankly, I would burst into tears somewhere on the bridge on my way over, hating the job as much as I did, I decided to walk away. Now, this was not the first time in my life that I parted company with a company, but this was the first time I did so my choice, and with a son who was now a junior in high school, a highly supportive um, but by choice non-working spouse, it was by far the biggest risk of my life. I had a brief, and I emphasize very brief, pity party. Then I got busy. I landed my first consulting opportunity with a former supplier who was helping me out, and I started putting one foot in front of the other. And I was making just enough to keep us afloat, the mortgage payment taken care of, and starting to see possibilities in this consulting gig when I got a call from a former colleague, yes again, whom I had worked with in that first job, asking me if I would be interested in going to work for her former boss, who had just become the CEO of Red Robin here in Denver. My first reaction was no. I'm committed to seeing my son through in high school. I'm staying in Seattle. But I said, I'll take lunch with him. I got to be at the National Restaurant Association show anyway. And I always believe in referring other talented people. So I'll give him five names and I'll move on. Well, two and a half hours later, I called my husband. And I said, you know what? I think I may want to go do this. He said, why? It's not Seattle. I said, well, that's what planes are for. It's a lot shorter commute than Miami. Um, he said, why? It's such a smaller company. And I said, yeah, but that's what growth is for. He said, it's also the same job. I had been doing, frankly, since my son was six. I had been a chief marketing officer or some version of it for all those years. Now that was the real problem. 
until in that lunch, I found myself saying, I can be your chief marketing officer, I can do that, and I'll do a great job of it, but what I really want is your job. I want to be a CEO. Now, when those words came out of my mouth, it's as though I was hovering somewhere up here above my body because I had never actually uttered them before. Shocking at my age, but I hadn't. And fortunately, the response wasn't, it's been great meeting you, we'll talk later. It was, that's great. Because, you know, I don't want to work that much longer. I want to get this thing turned around. And I need someone to succeed me. The rest is history. Five years later, Steve retired, and I became CEO. Now focused on turning the tide once again and finding someone to succeed me in a few years. So a few suggestions from my career stroll, and then we'll go on to the topic of resilience. Be really, really good at something, all the students out there, and really clear about your strengths. Don't waste time trying to be what you aren't. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy for everyone around you. Just make sure you surround yourself with people who complement your strengths. Give voice to your ambition like I finally did that day. Let people know what you want to achieve. Not in the foot stamping kind of entitled way that says, I demand this job tomorrow, but dream out loud and before you know it, you have all kinds of advocates that come your way. And behold, you'll find them pulling you along through the career. I saw a study the other day of women CEOs no, it's not one of the shortest books written, that old joke. It's a little bit bigger study than that. Unfortunately, still not enough of us, but women CEOs, 65% of them waited for somebody else to tell them they were capable of being a CEO before they put themselves forward. That's exactly what happened to me. Someone that I worked for said, you know what? You could run something one day, and I filed that away until the day I actually gave voice to it. So you have to find those advocates that are gonna tell you you're more capable than you think and push you to keep moving forward. Which brings me to the topic of resilience and how I came to understand its phenomenal power. Not through my own experience, but through that of my mom. And as I was coming out tonight and clicking through my slides, someone said, this is not a traditional CEO business presentation, but we'll get to that when we talk about the questions. I want to share her story so you can understand the real power of resilience. It's that elegant combination of steely strength and kind of willowy flexibility that enables you to bounce back and move on no matter what happens. I had the opportunity to speak just before Brene Brown spoke last week to a much larger actual group of 3,000 women in the food service industry and some guys, righteous brothers as we know them. But I got to speak before Brene Brown. I want to point out, I'm not as good as her, but I'm a lot cheaper. Um, so I do encourage you to watch her YouTube videos, though. Um, but she talks about the critical combination of risk and resilience in developing courageous leadership. And so I want to do my best to do it justice to speak about resilience now. This is my mom, Christina Maria Sokolowska, at the age of 17. Uh, she's sunning herself on the shores of the Baltic, and it's the summer of 1938. She and her sister, they were two daughters of a man who more wanted a boy than anybody, but he was stuck with these two daughters, and so he poured everything into them. He was a Polish senator who prided himself on his deep family roots in the country, a man of relative privilege with a wife of equal intelligence who read most of the day, which was possible because the girls were cared for by the staff. My mother and her younger sister, within one year, would have their worlds turned completely upside down. The Nazis invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. My mother's beloved father was taken in a raid and killed on a prison work crew. My mother supported her entire family for a time by working as a waitress which was brilliant because she, it was allowed her to ride inflation up with a set service tip, and she had more than many to take care of her family. My mother married her sweetheart, who was a Polish pilot, and found herself pregnant, giving birth to a son in a farmhouse away from the city with only her mother and, yes, her governess, believe it or not, in attendance. 
She ultimately left her son with them and returned to Warsaw where she became a member of the Polish underground. The Resistance People's Army and she served as a nurse. My mom was arrested and imprisoned in a prisoner of war camp before being liberated as the tide began to turn in Europe and serving as a translator because, oh, by the way, she sp spoke at least three languages in an office that was focused on repatriating refugees across Europe. While there, she met a young American army enlistee. Their first date was on the 4th of July. And they had a brief romance before returning to their lives and, yes, their respective spouses. Shocking, I know. My mother went back to the utter destruction of what was Warsaw, and my father returned to Inglewood, California. Having discovered that his high school bride was not his dream, after all, they divorced and my father, showing unusual persistence actually for him, tracked my mother down through the Red Cross and brought her across with her young son to America. This is my mom back on a beach, it's a much chillier one, in Northern California. They became a family. And she became the consummate officer's wife, moving 19 times in their marriage, having my sister, then my brother, and only my mother could look this good after giving childbirth, I'm sorry, <laughs> only my mother, and then having somebody that looks a little like me, and working all along the way at this or that, but never truly having a career. Story told, right? A survivor, well yes and no. After 31 years of marriage, just about the time this picture was taken, my father left my mom for another woman. He expected her, I think, to pack up and go back to Poland. Well, he was wrong. She got her half and the house, and then she went on to get not one but two college degrees at the age of 65, learned to drive, though that was an arguable skill for her. I never quite was sure she knew what she was doing. <laughs> She fell in love again with a man that she would stay by until he passed away of Alzheimer's and lung cancer when she was 89. She became a grandmother to four, and she saw them all grow into young adults in time to celebrate her 95th birthday party, which was her last celebration as she passed away three months later. Now that, folks, defines resilience which I didn't really come to understand until I had some of my own issues in my early 30s and realized her phenomenal strength by comparison to that of my father. You know, when we're teenagers, we battle. When we're in our 20s, we try to separate as rapidly as we can. And hopefully, somewhere in those early 30s, you come back around to realize just how wonderful your parents are. So I was lucky. I came from some really strong stock. But here's the important thing. Anyone can learn to be resilient. And I want to offer you three takeaways to understand that it is a skill that can be learned. Here are the three keys to resilience. The first is always to face the facts. Accept them, move forward, don't create your own story. They are what they are, they're the facts, and you need to move forward. The second is to stay strong, and again, particularly for women out there, Find that network that lifts you up, doesn't drag you back down. Stay strong, stay healthy, be capable. And the third and most critical is to adopt a growth mindset. There's a professor by the name of Carol Dweck who has written extensively about a growth mindset, and I encourage you to go and learn more. But I will tell you, this is the most critical portion. A growth mindset is so important because it is the polar opposite to a fixed mindset. Someone with a fixed mindset will say, I can't. I can't do it. Someone with a growth mindset will say, I haven't learned how to do it yet. A fixed mindset are the folks who are trying to look smart. A growth mindset are the people who are trying to get smart. The expression, fake it till you make it, is kind of halfway right but there is a whole lot of people who are trying to fake it till you make it and never really getting smart about what they do. A fixed mindset, if somebody else gets a job, ends up resenting the fact that somebody else got that job. It's a matter of scarcity, right? 
Whereas somebody who has a growth mindset says, what do I have to learn to be able to be considered the next time and goes after it? A fixed mindset will avoid challenges at all cost. A growth mindset embraces them. And the last is definitely a fixed mindset is easily defeated where a growth mindset is capable, always capable of moving on. So I truly believe that resilience is the key to everything in a career and in a business, and anything can be overcome, whether that be bad grades, I know it's finals week, uh, whether it be a job loss, an addiction, a divorce, or uh, in a public company, a bad quarter or even two. You can bounce back if you face the facts, you stay strong, and you grow from it. So if you'll take my word for it, I can assure you that you can always move on. You can always achieve more than you ever dreamed of. You can live a life that's full of joy, and before you know it, you'll find yourself speaking to a room full of people in velvet seats. <laughs> and I sincerely hope for all the young men and women that are out there that you both get the equal opportunity to do so. And with that, I look forward to taking some questions. Thank you. I appreciate it. Non-traditional. Thanks, Denny. That was great. So we're going to have a little bit of conversation, great. and then we'll open it up in the last few minutes to questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to hear, and I'm guessing others are, about how Red Robin is positioned in the marketplace, uh, what the, the major competitive forces are that are at play, um, and, and, and how you're responding. <laughs> um, so uh, Red Robin, as I said, is 50 years old. So we are about the same age as all of the casual dining restaurants we all grew up with. I'm seeing some faces out there. Um, casual dining, of course, grew, 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 grew in the uh, 80s, 90s. You couldn't build them fast enough. And why? Because people were out going to theaters and they were out uh, shopping retail like never before. There was such a boom. And uh, so on the one hand, we are part of one of the most difficult segments in the restaurant industry. Fine dining is doing great. Quick service never seems to fail. Fast casual is kind of a funky definition. I'm not sure it's real anyway. And casual dining is the one that's really struggling because it was part of something else you were doing. You were going to the movie theater, so you wanted to zip through, grab a burger, and move on. Well, what are you doing now? You're staying home, you're binge watching Netflix, and you're shopping on your iPad. So um, how we're navigating that is we're very fortunate on a couple of fronts. One. Um, we have always served a unique uh, group in that we do better with families with young children than almost anybody else in our category. Uh, it's just always been a strong suit. We believe in multi-generational um, target, and we do very well there. I, nothing makes me happier than walking into a Red Robin and seeing three or four generations sitting together at a table. That's heaven. Um, secondly, we stand for something. Unlike a lot of what would be varied menu, uh, bar and grill, um, we stand for gourmet burgers, and the good news is that is still one of the two most popular categories in food, pizza and burgers. So there doesn't seem to be an unlimited demand for that. Our challenge is to find ways to compete on an ongoing basis, to steal share for the waning amount of time that people are spending out, making sure we take care of those families better than anybody else, and at the same time, pivoting our business from purely destination to being a destination and a source through delivery, carry out, et cetera, catering um, for off-premise occasions. And we think we're in a good place to do that. It just takes a little more patience than sometimes Wall Street wants to give you. So I'm not surprised mm -hmm. by you bringing up uh, delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, that is certainly a huge pressure that yeah. bricks and mortar restaurants are experiencing. So. How are you positioning to address delivery? And for those in the audience who, who wouldn't just know, why is delivery such a challenge? Uh, it's a challenge on a number of uh, factors. One is the growth in delivery right now is coming from third party groups. So overnight, um, Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates have all just appeared. Um, and they all thrive on a gig economy. Um, the folks who work for them may also be driving you to the airport in an Uber or 
They may have a lift thing also on the window. You may be riding with somebody else's pizza on the way to the airport. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's the reality of it. Uh, it is a fascinating kind of wild, wild west world, but these groups have come up. So they've come between us and our guest. You know, it used to be a one-to-one -one relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and now they have intersected and they've created their own marketplaces. And so online, uh, if you are a Grubhub app customer or DoorDash, you go in there and you say, well, I mean, I want to stay home tonight. It's usually the first decision people make. And then they go in and they say, what do I want to do? I want to have food delivered to me. Well, here are all these great resources. Now, here's the challenge of that. Um, the financial model for that third party comes both out of our hides and from the, the guest. Customer. Yeah. The customer, we call him the right. guest. Um, I had a $7 sandwich delivered that cost $7 to be delivered a couple weeks ago. Um, I can afford to do that, but it was still dumb. It was just dumb. Um, I wasn't that hungry. I could have certainly found five more people to eat with me or do something, or I could have gotten in my car and driven or walked, God forbid, walk, uh, over to a restaurant and taken care of that. But you never underestimate Americans' appetite and willingness to pay for convenience. Um, I mean, that, if over the years, I mean, I, who'd have ever, I would have never thought I'd order shoes online, um, much less buy a mattress in a box that got delivered at my front door to, uh, my latest car, we, we found a used car online and had it shipped from across the country. It was exactly what we wanted. I never set foot on a car lot. Right. So we're, we're, we're disaggregating the relationship. And so it's challenging financially. It's challenging because it breaks up that relationship. And it's challenging from a quality standpoint. Mm -hmm. We cannot tell them they have an algorithm that tells them where to drive on any given day. Well, that algorithm is a fancy way for saying, if there's not enough demand, I'll drive further. And so I have no control over how far our food goes. And it deteriorates in the process. Uh, absolutely. Now, we've all been you know, driving through and, and carrying home burgers and fries for a long time. And, and a pizza is never as good as a pizza you have in a restaurant. So mm -hmm. people are willing to take some of that. But the lack of control over it is one of the biggest issues. So when you don't own your customer, because mm -hmm. Grubhub does, and you can't control quality, how do you address that? Well, you, number one, you try to incent the guest to come and, and deal with you directly. So uh, it creates um, a, a situation, and if you're aware, I mean, Domino's, for example, who has their own self-delivery uh, and does very well with it, their new business model is to incent you to come carry out because it's becoming so expensive even for them to maintain their own delivery force. Mm -hmm. So they now um, put more incentive in, they'll give you a better deal on that pizza if you'll come by and pick it up. Right. So we, we, number one, try to make that really easy uh, and try to do as much as we can to get carry out in that direct relationship. We can still help you get great restaurant quality food home. Mm -hmm. We'll just ask that you try to do so directly with us and we'll give you the rewards associated with our loyalty program, et cetera. We can do that in that model. We can't in the other. One of the other things that you addressed in your answer to the first question was around the, the segment that you're operating in. And the competition has really thrived on bar mm -hmm. as much or more than food. Yeah. And yet you're priding the business, you're priding yourself on the business being so family friendly. How does, how does that affect, how does that family friendliness affect your food and beverage mix? Well, we have a much lower alcohol mix than our competitors do. Um, now, again, when, when Red Robin got started 50 years ago in Seattle, it was to the Northwest what Chili's was to Texas, what TGI Friday's was to the Northeast, um, and we were all kind of a hangout at the time. So we have a much stronger bar business in the Northwest, for example, mm. than down in Tennessee where we can hardly uh, sell anything with alcohol in it. Um, but So we have a variety there. But again, I actually think that works to our advantage. Um, because we are not so dependent on that, we don't have as much risk associated with off-premise because, mm -hmm. again, we're not giving up that alcohol sale. You are giving up typically the beverage sale because most people have something at home they're going right. to drink. Um, but for us, I think it's a little less vulnerable on that front. And we honestly don't believe we've focused a lot on, on beer. Um, beer and wine, I mean, uh, was Roseanne Barr. I used to have a great line uh, when she was just a stand-up com comedian about, you know, if, if, uh, if he gets home and the kids are still alive, I deserve a glass of wine. I've done my job. So I, I do feel like, you know, having a glass of wine or a beer 
much less, I mean, generationally, I think we're coming back to more of a balanced place around that. Mm -hmm. So it isn't inconsistent to have those available, right. but we're certainly not a, a place where, you know, people come for happy hour and late Have night kind of three. things, and that that's just not our thing. Right. So, uh, but we do give up a lot of. There's a lot of margin in that business. Right. Yeah. A lot more margin than in food. Yes, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. in your in your talk, you you talked about women particularly, uh, but that leads to a broader question around talent and talent acquisition, mm -hmm. and the challenges around finding and retaining really top talent. Mm -hmm. So. What are you seeing in terms of operating your business and, and how are you addressing that? A large part of it comes back to um, a culture, uh, a culture that people want to be a part of. Um, we pride ourselves, our mission is to make everyone better for being here, whether you're a, a team member, a guest, or a shareholder. Um, so our, our goal is to, to do that for everyone and we're very forward about that. Um, I think in terms of being able to attract a broader uh, range of talent, the fact that we have a board that's 50-50 men and women, an executive team that's virtually 50-50 men and women. Um, a lot of women, our most senior operating leaders in the field are women, um, means that people can look, uh, women in particular can look up and say, you know, there's opportunity here. So I think we get a better um, opportunity to get the diversity that's required mm -hmm. um, to really take advantage of all the talent that's out there. Uh, so that certainly helps us. Um, we work hard to, um, to create development opportunities. Uh, we still bring all of our, every single one of our general managers together once a year, which is not an inexpensive wow. effort. We did it here in Denver this year. We'll be doing it in Denver every other year going forward. Um, and, and that's a big investment. In the off years, we invite them to bring a plus one, so we mm -hmm. make it part of the family. You know, again, if you're working this hard, everybody's got to be pretty much invested in that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that helps us. But I will tell you, we were best in class in turnover a year ago, and uh, there are some things that we did within our business and some of the challenges just of, of, um, of the options that people have. I mean, you know, with the resurgence in construction, would you rather work in the heart of the house uh, late at night um, on a fryer or hang drywall um, and get home right. in time to see your family? Um, so there's, there's a real competition across industries that we're seeing. Uh, but we have to make ourselves a preferred culture where people feel like they can advance, mm -hmm. um, where they can have, uh, frankly, this is where not having a lot of alcohol in our restaurants helps. You rarely have to deal with drunks or any of the stuff that comes with staying open until 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have more of a lifestyle, a balanced lifestyle. And, uh, but it's a battle. It is a definite battle right now. And particularly at the hourly level, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can walk next door and have a job in a second, a nanosecond. So, 70% of the student population in the Fritz Noble School, about, is women. 70, give or take, 69 or 71. Yeah, yeah. right, right about. <laughs> and, um, and that's a great thing, and I can tell you from my conversations with a lot of those young women that a major concern of theirs is their ability to advance mm. and have a family. Yep. And you address that in, in a way that some don't get the opportunity no. to, um, and you mentioned that. Yeah, um, and absolutely. So how, how in, at Red Robin are you helping women who are moving through the organization, moving up in the organization, take advantage of the opportunity to move up and still have that balance? Never well enough, you know? I mean, I, I cannot honestly say that, that um, we do as much as we probably should to make that possible for both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, because I think one of the things I love most generationally is I do see far more balance in how men play a role in, in their children's lives and certainly was the case when I was growing up or um, I had the unique advantage of my husband and the choices that we made and him being willing to support me and, and make it possible for me to travel and do all the things I did. Um, so I, you know, I, I think what we, what we definitely try to do is we try to create enough flexibility. Um, so two different levels. At the home office, um, we really try to create a lot of flexibility around work style. Uh, we're not clock punchers. We can't be anymore. We have, uh, we have extensive uh, paid time off. Um, we really work hard to, 
try to make sure people can put a priority on, on having a family life and time with their families. At the restaurant level, I think the thing I'm probably proudest of and I watch for is we, we look for, uh, we let people step back. I had, I've seen this happen quite a, quite a bit, where someone will say, you know what, I just, I'm not right for management right now. And if you're in a state like California where the minimum wage is $15 plus tips, you can work the shifts you choose to work and step back from management and frankly, maybe even do better a little bit financially, but just cap that and then we'll let them come back. So mm -hmm. I've seen people do the step back, step up kind of opportunity. And then there's a lot of informal networks within the restaurants themselves about caring for their children, caring for each other, mm -hmm. uh, which goes on. But I think the biggest thing is just to create as much flexibility as you possibly can, be it for men or women, so that they can participate in their family lives because that's part of what brings balance. So that's a, an enlightened view. Uh, I, <laughs> in my experience, that's not a view that's widely shared in and I can't say it's a, I can't say it's 100% done either because I can't I don't have visibility to all of our sure, restaurants to know sure. exactly how well that's being done. So what you triggered for me is is something that has long annoyed me about <laughs> hospitality. I've annoyed you. No, you haven't. <laughs> this this thing does. That's all right. You're, you're not I'm, rare. But I, I want to hear you actually. opine about it. Um, <laughs> I so annoy lots of people. <laughs> the, the industry is really quite insular. Uh -huh. And we benchmark internally, rather than looking at who does the thing we're interested in doing better, best. That's a great point. It is a great point. And, and really, there are organizations. There's an organization called TDM2K that has a whole elaborate people report, black box, uh, social media report. But it's, you're right, it's all within restaurants. It's all within restaurants. So we compare there. Um, whereas if you look across other industries, now I do think we should be able to lead in mm -hmm. restaurants again particularly in women advancement, because mm -hmm. we start out with this incredible pipeline of women. Um, I, we participate every year in the Women in the Workplace study that McKinsey does, um, and we have the strongest pipeline to begin with, uh, and yet we lose so many, in, particularly in the management, the, uh, from individual unit management to multiple unit management is where we lose folks. Mm -hmm. um, how do we figure out ways to be better at that? How do we right. benchmark across other industries? Um, I'd like to think others will benchmark off us because we can get better and better at it, but it's a great, it's a great challenge. The study will allow us to do that right. um, in the sense that it looks at everything from technology, um, uh, who by the way have a far worse record for women obviously, um, to healthcare, which has a far better, um, mm -hmm. I think healthcare probably without a doubt, you see the best um, progression from, from pipeline all the way through to leadership, still not perfect, but better. So the study's helping us do that on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Good. You mentioned uh, in sort of a, a throwaway line, the impatience of Wall Street. Oh, yeah. And um, to me, that was not throwaway. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth coming back to. Uh, and so in, in an industry and a time and place where uh, it, it couldn't be more changeful, it couldn't be more turbulent, there couldn't be more pressures from the segments on either side of you. How do you keep Wall Street at bay when, when Wall Street's interested in quarterly and you're really doing the next turnaround? <laughs> uh, that is truly, that is exactly what I, uh, what we as a team are trying to navigate right now. Um, and, and, you know, we had a, we had a tremendous year in 2017. Um, uh, in a category that has been in secular decline, traffic declining for 12 years, we had positive traffic in 2017, which is unheard of in casual dining. Um, and then uh, we hit 2018, and, and through a combination of, of self-inflicted wounds, um, a, a market mover in one of our competitors who's 3x or more our size, uh, and, and then just this, what I was talking about, this organic, this change of people just getting away from going out to eating out, um, going out to eat out, but still sourcing food, uh, we just saw a real change over the last year. Um, the biggest thing for me is to be as transparent and as clear and as honest about what we know and what we don't know as we can be. Um, we try very hard um, to, um, to be, uh, to just kind of lay it open. This is what we know, this is what we're working on and commit ourselves to making progress. We are making progress. Um, 
and navigating that sense of getting back on track to at least stabilize the base of our business so that all this great opportunity layers on as true upside. And that's our challenge right now, is to say, just hang in there with us. We believe we can stabilize the foundation um, and continue to grow all these wonderful upside opportunities we have around to-go and catering and, and yes, delivery to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, though ultimately, I'd love to see us do that ourselves, but that requires a scale and a choicefulness about where we would do that. Um, but if we can get that, if we can get them bought back in on the stabilization of the foundation, then we're in good place to go forward from there. And then a lot of it is making sure you got the right, um, the right investors. Um, you know, it is a bit maddening because you've got investors you can see and then you've got the index funds that can move you very quickly um, one day to the next because that's become such a power on Wall Street. Uh, and, you know, you can't go tell your story to a computer. It just doesn't work. Um, but you can sit down and talk with long-term shareholders and explain to them what you're doing and hear their feedback. It's not simple. Um, I think the restaurant business overall, people look at it and they go, how hard can it be? How hard can it be to run a restaurant? Come on, you know, it can't be that hard. It is without a doubt one of the most deceptively complex businesses in the world. Uh, the margins are thin, not as thin as grocery, but they're thin. Um, they are, it is, uh, you know, you open up every day and you try to, to, to satisfy some people and hang on to your team and, and, it's, and you have 500 and something, 583 manufacturing plants across the United States who may or may not be getting it right today. Um, supply chain, all the complexities of it. And it's a very complex business and only getting that much more complex. Mm -hmm. So it's not for the faint of heart from a leadership standpoint or an investor standpoint. But I do believe that it is something that is, um, it will evolve for certain, but it will always fill a need and mm -hmm. will always have a place, at least for my foreseeable future. Right. And many others. I hope generations to come. So, I hope so too. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we kind of built a school on it. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> so, drawing from your, your past, your path, uh, as an innovator, both in product and mm -hmm. marketing, what do you see, you know, when you look in your crystal ball, what do you see in the restaurant industry in terms of innovation, where do we go next? Well, I think it's come from, you know, I grew, I grew up and a lot of the innovation I did was um, chicken fries at, at Burger King or high caffeine coffee or Pike Place roast or um, we did the little stopper that goes to the top of a, of a cup was done when I was there, my team. Um, now it's plastic and I know that's you know an issue but it saved a lot of uh, cuffs from being stained by being able to carry your coffee across the room. Um, you know, innovations like that, small things, um, small bits of news, um, you know, this week's burger or that, you know, that new thing. It's changing to where it's much more about how we present, uh, how we ch change our experience. So I say innovation needs to come in the form of experience, mm -hmm. um, more so than just the food on the plate, the totality of how it's presented and that choice of, for us, a family, what makes it a complete evening. Um, and then beyond that, rebundling the things that we do in ways that work for home. Um, you know, we found with our catering proposition, our burger bar has been incredi incredibly well received, mm -hmm. um, much more so than we frankly expected. Um, but people are just dying for a change from cold sandwiches and, and one more taco bar. Um, and people are eating in the, re in, the, in the office environment much more so. So I think a lot of it's gonna come from uh, re reconsidering what we do and presenting it in new ways, not necessarily what we make, okay. um, but new ways, packaging, um, new ways of getting it to the guests, new ways of considering about uh, what loyalty means and how you earn or, or can, can get rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. That's where the real innovation is going to come going forward. So what, if you have to tell one piece of advice beyond resilience, hmm. particularly to the students and those who would like to be students again. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't we all? Gosh. What would you, what would you? I would be such a good student if I could just go back now. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was a good student. I was an okay student. I was, I was, uh, I'd be so much better student if I could go back now. But, hmm. So with no regrets, one piece of advice? but what would you do? What, you know, what would you tell your, your younger self? Um, I think that whole notion of, of being willing to 
to give voice to what you want to accomplish earlier, voice to your ambition, I think is the most critical thing because we hold back, um, we're afraid to state it. We're either afraid that if we say it, we're committed or we'll sound silly or you know, how could I possibly wish to be in your seat? Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet if you, if you feel weird about saying I want to be this, then simply say, you know, one of my dreams is to one day be like so-and-so or whatever. The minute you do that, it's amazing how networks of people just come alongside you. And, and again, I, I make the point, I have had people, the guy who hired me out of college ended up running Yum! Brands. His name is David Novak. He's a remarkable leader. And he literally, in some ways, pulled me all the way through. The newest member of our, of our board is somebody that I knew who was, who's now um, a CEO. He was a mentor to me early on. He was one of those people who kind of uh, pulled me along because I was willing to say, in smaller increments, this is what I really want to do. I want to do this. I really want to be this. But just keep at that. Keep giving voice to your ambition and don't hold back and don't feel like you have to have figured out everything. And then please, please, whatever you do, be flexible, not linear, about how you're going to get there. Um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I got probably midway through my career was from a, a woman that I, I met, and she said, you know, often when we, and it's one of those analogies, but when you stand at the bottom of a mountain and you look up, all you can see is one path to the top, right? Because your view is, is contained from here to there. If you'll project yourself forward to the top and look back down, there's a whole bunch of ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to realize is you're not going to just do from here to here. You're going to jog and do this. And oh, by the way, you may come all the way around the other side and do something completely different. But be open to that because there's nothing more frustrating as a coach than to feel like you're coaching somebody who is going home every night and they've got a timeline on their wall and they're not quite there yet and they're just mad they're not there yet and they won't stop and consider that maybe they need to go sideways mm -hmm. or develop a little bit differently. So it's that giving voice to your ambition and being willing to be flexible and not linear about how your career plays out. And if I may, it yep. seems like that climb, when you're just focused on that one path and it's more about getting there than it is about the path, it's really about ego. Yeah, it's very good, that's very, it's very true. Uh, and that, and the ego is not what ultimately plays out. Humility plays out. True leaders have got an understanding of what they're good at and not good at. Mm -hmm. and like I said, that whole growth mindset, if you're willing to say, you know, not just try to act like you're smart, but actually get smart about some things. Mm -hmm. And then also the notion of just know what you're really good at and don't try to be, don't try to be all those other things because there's always somebody who's good at that and they can be part of a team. And Teamwork, um, you know, again, is the key to so much of this. So I know we have a, just a little bit of time left, and I want to open it up to the audience for questions now. We have, are we, are we hovering with a, with a There's microphone? somebody with a mic who can Good help you Lord, out. Lord, this light. And no extra points for anyone from Red Robin asking me a question. <laughs> I, see, I do see a row of you guys, and I'm very happy to see you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Hi, thanks so much for, wow, this is loud, huh? <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. Great presentation. Thank you. you mentioned about boards. As a former Big Five consultant, management consultant, I am so excited to serve on a board. I'm sure there's other women and men here as well. A couple tips on how do we find that board, how do we apply, how do we make it work? Wow, this is one of the things that's changing so rapidly in our world because boards for the longest time were, um, uh, it, was, it was the classic old boys network. Um, one who knew they served with someone else, therefore that person would be great, you know, kind of just pluck and pull along. Um, I will say also the good news is that the makeup of boards is shifting from purely CEOs, which is mostly what it was, um, to, uh, to sub some subject matter expertise. Boards are becoming more and more aware of the need to understand complexities around technology, for example, or, or people, or any of the areas uh, that can really trip you up if you're, if you're leading a board. Um, so the world is moving in your direction. A uh, couple of things. One, get really clear about what you have to offer, and you have to make that transition from what you offered when you were, you were in consulting, which is a little bit, uh, perhaps a little easier transition than somebody who's in management, because there's a huge difference between being in management and being on board. 
Um, they're very, uh, very distinct roles, and so really take a look at that and be clear about what value you would add, what unique expertise you would bring that would help a board be smarter about um, helping supervise the business they supervise but not manage it, basically you know, lead, um, be there for the CEO of the company. So get really clear about what you'd add. Um, that's, that's critical. Um, get yourself into some of the networks, and there are some great emerging networks, particularly for women, who, that are bec becoming great clearinghouses. And here in town, there's a number of different women's leadership organizations that's focused on, that are focused on trying to bring women forward. Um, and there's a lot of demand and need. So get yourself wired into those. And if you want to catch me on the side, I'll be glad to, to make sure I get your name and get you connected. Um, so that's critical. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, the, the service on a non, on a, um, I started with a, a small private board um, and did that for a number of years and went through an acquisition. I was the only independent director carried forward, which was great. So, you know, be open to smaller companies, private companies. Obviously, don't try to make the leap immediately to the lovely pressures and, and compliance issues <laughs> of, a, of a public board. Um, but be open to that as a possibility. And network, 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 network. But every time you do, be sure you have your speech, you know, you know exactly what you're offering and, and work at that. The other thing is get really smart about it. There are a lot of great courses also that get people ready, uh, women and men ready for boards. Um, uh, it, it, some of those board readiness classes are really helpful as well. Awesome, thank you, and I will catch you on the side. Catch me and I'll make sure I get you connected. Yes, you mentioned um, an author, and I got the first name of Carol. Carol Dweck. Black? D-W-E-C-K. D-W-E-C-K. Yeah, she's, uh, she's and what's either the name USC of the book? or UCLA, and I know that's, that's like, you don't want to mix those two up, but I'm not from California. <laughs> so I know I've offended somebody by mixing them, but she's, a, but she's definitely, uh, she's a professor that's done great work around fixed versus growth mindset, done some great writing on it. And do you know the name of her book? I don't offhand, but um, okay. I can find mindset. it by Is it called Mindset? Thank you. From the front row, okay. we have uh, Mindset. Um, somehow, yeah, my mind was not set to give you that title, but okay. um, <laughs> Thank Carol Dweck, you. Mindset. And then again, if you have not, uh, has everybody here had a chance to see Brene Brown speak either on YouTube or uh, I definitely encourage you to see anything Brene Brown's got to say about courageous leadership. A uh, few of us, Lauren, I see you, we got to see her speak last week. And, She's pretty remarkable on the whole topic of courageous leadership. Both professors, both done some really great research. Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. Sure. Uh, my name is Cecilia Ortega Lagos, and I am a executive MBA graduate from great. DU. <laughs> great. I wanted to ask you, um, in your industry, how is artificial intelligence and data analytics impacting, especially around the customer experience side? around the customer experience side, boy, yeah. that's a great question. Um, not, you know, it's still uh, emerging, but as we get displaced or let's say disaggregated by these third party groups, I think we're seeing more and more of that come to the fore. So, you know, traditionally um, uh, the restaurant experience was between two people and a menu, right, for the most part. But now because of the online, how much of it is going online into digital, um, it is getting to the point where uh, not only that, you know, put, we can put forward uh, what we most want to put forward for you to consider that day, uh, and that could be ultimately based on what we know we have available or what we need to work through if we have inventory challenges. You can certainly do some of that if the data is there to support it. You can start to understand regionally. You can't print a menu four months in advance and, and make it work, you know, regionally for all kinds of, it's just too complex, but you can sure do that online or digitally. You can, you can customize based on, on uh, trends in purchasing. Um, and then you can absolutely suggest and put forward things that you know people tend to have together. So the Amazonification of the world um, is definitely teaching all of us how to get there. But I'll say that we're slow to catch up because we've just never been, we actually have lots of data about, about what's uh, consumed in our restaurants, but actually capturing that and using it in a way that's really powerful is a challenge for a company of our scale. Um, so, you know, we, we're investing more in IT right now than, than virtually almost anything, and it's a big bet. It's a big bet to be able to get to that kind of um, 
artificial intelligence, um, data-driven decision-making, and the solutions that are really going to make us um, more successful and, and be able to be more profitable on that front. So I hope that helps. But it's, it's, it's coming slowly, but it, it, slowly and, and not, because the, the whole online interaction with guests is happening so fast. It's one of the fastest growing parts of our business by far. So you have a question over here, and then I saw somebody down front. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. We loved it. Thank you. Um, follow up on that uh, data analysis. Sustainability green practices is in the forefront. Colorado is leading the country. And you came from Seattle, that ahead of it. Yeah, just a little and bit. And restaurant associations are doing a lot of things. What your company is doing, make your company more sustainable, more green. Wow. Um, uh, this is another one I'm going to say not enough, um, you know, in that sense. We're trying to get greater and greater visibility to our supply chain and the choices that we make there with regards to. Um, obviously, all the way back up, all the way back up uh, the process in terms of, of making the right choices around uh, the suppliers we work with. That's critical. Um, I will tell you, this whole packaging issue is one of the greatest ones for us right now. It's as simple as the plastic straw, and it's as tough as the plastic straw. Um, I uh, paper straw guys tell me quickly. Someone down front, what 5x cost? Um, you know, for us to be able to make that choice. And oh, by the way, not nearly as good. Um, so, uh, so may get used twice, which means it's 10x cost. Uh, so those kinds of trade-outs are, are really a challenge for us from a margin standpoint. Um, so trying to, trying to be smart about um, the choices we're making about minimizing packaging is probably one of the most critical. Uh, we get a lot of heat about um, people eat our food and then they get left with all this plastic. We know we have to solve for that. We got to get better at that. Um, but I would say, um, because we've traditionally been an on-site in many ways, when you think about it, a destination food got, um, your dishes got washed and reused and all those kinds of things. Now moving to this off-premise world where when I was at Burger King or Starbucks, I mean, we operated there all day long, every day. Uh, it's for us an investment, but it's one we can make more thoughtfully because we're not already trapped in an existing system. So that was a really circular way of saying not nearly as good as we should be. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you, that's not something I've resourced heavily, but I am very aware of it because the millennial family that's coming up cares a lot about that. Yeah. And, and we know that not only do they care about the ingredients in their food, but they care very much about how it's sourced and, and then importantly, how it's packaged. So it's one of those things we're just going to have to move on over time. And I, don't, I hope it doesn't happen to us all from legislation because that makes it so, com again, complex is my word, but, uh, you know, um, straw bands and stuff like that. I, I, we just need to get there the right way, do it for the right reasons. <clears throat> Thank you, Denny. My name is Susie Zan. I'm the co-founder of Z Choice International and help companies to navigate globally oh, great. and especially have the global growth mindset. And I really appreciate what you've done. And uh, it's uh, refreshing to hear your story because I spent 25 years in the food industry mm. as well. So I really appreciate that. And the people who haven't been in the food industry probably haven't really appreciated enough of what you've gone through. So thank you for that. My question, though, is that um, how do you leverage global uh, scales uh, or global exper experience to help Red Ribbon grow? Well, we, uh, so we are, uh, uh, um, operate in 42 U.S. Uh, states and two western provinces of Canada. So um, we, ha we are not, we often get invited. I get lots of, of contacts from folks who would love to take us as an American brand overseas. Um, you know, candidly, I think the world's got enough American brands, and that's just simply not a priority for us right now. But what we do try to learn from, and I will come back to, is, is, is we try to learn from trends that are happening around the world. I definitely saw this in technology. I saw it at Starbucks. Um, you know, the first, uh, the first drive-through that I ever went through for a Starbucks was in, um, was in Japan. I was told not to talk about it when I came back um, because that was not the third place experience. Uh, see, show me, a drive, show me a Starbucks built without a drive-through now, right? Uh, they got over that because um, they figured out it was a really great source of business. So I think it, it being aware of um, global trends, the adoption, as the gentleman was just talking about, um, green packaging, some of those are, things are going to definitely come from around the world. 
uh, and then um, obviously the diversification of the country and, and the things that we need to be able to and be willing to do um, in terms of changing, our, changing the profiles of our food, mainstreaming. Uh, we participate every year in a thing called the Burger Bash at the Food and Wine Festival. And we sponsor with FIU, which is a good hospitality school, um, their program of scholarship. And we had 410 entries from the students this year. And the, the, their, their willingness to experiment with global flavors and source all kinds of things and bring it together is just unlimited. So we try to stay aware of that. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm glad I don't have the complexity of operating on a global level right now. I don't envy my friends who do. Um, you know, but uh, so it, it, it's an opportunity for us always. Is there one more there in front? There's a couple. Hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm a full-time MBA student here at DU. Um, you talked a little bit about being an expert in one thing, and clearly you uh, had that marketing theme throughout your entire career. So as you became CEO, how did you surround yourself with people who kind of helped um, fill in those areas where you needed a little bit of help or you weren't as confident? Uh, how, and what do you look for in that's leaders, the, leaders that's coming That's the up? most fun. That, that is the absolute most fun. of. I mean, I, I love being CEO. I love uh, the opportunity to run this company. But what I love most is the ability to surround myself with incredibly talented people who are so different from me. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm really fortunate to have that opportunity. Um, so one of the things we use is, uh, if you aren't familiar with it, is Gallup Strengths Finders. Um, anybody here ever taken the Gallup Strengths Finders opportunity? Yeah, I'm so glad to see that's so popular. We're actually starting to talk with Gallup. Everybody in my row better have taken it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the reason that we use Gallup Strengths Finders is there's 35, as I remember, 35 strengths you can have. Uh, the first thing it just basically tells you is what are your top five. My top five are ideator, positivity, strategic, relator, and maximizer. Um, the first time I heard those five, like I said, it was the first time was like looking in a mirror and actually liking what I saw. Because for years I had been told all the things I was not. I didn't have a head for numbers. I wasn't uh, analytical. Well, sure enough, guess what? Way down on the list. But I have a, when I went out to replace myself as chief marketing officer, I brought in somebody I worked with before. And one of the things that makes us so much of a great partnership is he's a highly analytical marketer. And I'm not, I'm an intuitive marketer. So um, if I just hired in my own stead, then we wouldn't have the benefit of that diversity of thought and style. So we embrace strengths. Um, we actually, uh, we don't use it as a hiring tool so much as we use it as a basis for understanding why we approach things differently. Um, our former CFO, who's now our COO, Chief Operating Officer, um, is really high in context. And that's something that I need, because I, I need somebody to help me round out the story. Um, so strengths is one way, uh, and then being real clear, as much as you're clear about what you're good at, being really clear at what you're not good at goes a long way in the world, um, because then you don't feel like you have to pretend, and, uh, and you just surround yourself with people that you just admire for what they bring. It's the, that's the best part. That's, that's what gets me. I love everything about what I do, but that's the thing I love most. We have one last question okay. over here. All right, thank you very much. I'm a Daniels alum, 40-year Red Robin burger eater, way yes. back to Seattle. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you uh, thank to my you. dad for that. So, uh, You have a tremendous story of uh, relationships woven through uh, yeah. the resilience uh, talk. Can you tell us uh, what, what's your secret sauce? What should we uh, take away? Because you've certainly mastered it, so thank you. Of for relationships? It. Yes. Um, one year, there's always enough time to help out a friend um, uh, or a colleague, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, truly, I just always, uh, I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was a little bit frustrated myself because I committed to having coffee with somebody who'd reached out to me after she heard the thing I did on the CPR and, and, you know, she's a young woman and whatever. And, you know, so I said, I got there. I said, I got 15 minutes. We ended up spending 30. I was a little late getting over here maybe. But, um, you know, it's just always time for that. Um, I, I truly do um, pride myself most on what I say is, you know, what my handprint on other people's back, which is who have I brought along with me all the time? Um, because that's what fuels me. I get really happy when I see folks that I've worked with over time um, end up doing great things and moving on to great things. But I'd say it's just, it's just always having time. I guess I just always say yes to that because it rarely, 
for me anyway, because I'm a relator, that actually fuels me. It doesn't drain me. If it drains you, find another way to do it because life's too short to be drained, right? And we've got too many other priorities. But for me, it really fuels me. So I just always say yes and my door stays open and I try to make time to stop and, and really understand every time I can. And then I am always happy to take a call from somebody who's looking for somebody, like I'll get to know you and find out what you want about the boards. I get a lot of calls and a lot of things I can't do. Um, I, you know, I've got, a, again, a full-time job, and, but I'm really quick to say here are four great people you ought to consider. Uh, and so just being willing to do that, it has a way of paying itself back a million times over. Someday I may need those folks to do that favor for me. Well, thank you helps. all for being here. Thank you. For those among you for whom continuing ed credits are a reason for being here, you can take care of that in the lobby on, on your way out. Like a 12 -step program um, we need to get we have up. two more uh, VOEs coming up uh, this spring. Stay tuned for details on those. They'll be coming via email. I want to thank Denny for being here and thank for you. sharing your story and the lessons you've learned. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And there's reception following this part of the evening, and please enjoy that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. I have to make sure. Thanks for making it so easy.